Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you with us. We are studying the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the months of April, May, and June of 2013. We do regular handouts for these materials, and if you'd like to look at the handouts that we sort of use as our guidelines for our discussion, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G. This particular lesson is lesson number seven in that series, entitled God's Special People, Micah. And it's the lesson for May 18 of 2013. We hope you enjoy it as much as we have. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Get your Bible ready. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study your word and to see the struggles that some of your friends went through so long ago and to help us understand that we're not the only ones who might be struggling. We thank you for Micah's insights and your work with him and the very significant words that he says in portions of his small book. May we open those and learn from them tonight is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, just a very brief overlook, uh, look at this book. In this book, Micah receives visions of God's grief over Judah's and Israel's evil deeds. Their coming destruction and later deliverance, the capture of Jerusalem. Micah is the very first prophet to predict the downfall of Jerusalem. And now he's doing this 120 years advanced because he's living approximately at the time of the downfall of Samaria in the north but he's predicting the future downfall of Jerusalem. And that's found in Micah 3, verse 12. And the future arrival of the Son of Man, and that's Micah 5, 2. Micah discusses two key events, the capture of the city of David and the comings of the Son of David. Now, in the Old Testament, they tended to put all the comings of Jesus together. They thought that all the events of what we now know as the first coming and the events which we now hope for at the second coming and the events we believe will happen at the third coming, they sort of clumped those all together. They talked about the day of the Lord and they thought all that was going to happen at the same time. As Micah addresses God's case against Israel and his compassion for, his, for the people, his confidence in God grows. Well, so what's different about this book? Well, unlike Jonah, and we all know the story of Jonah, his message in that book is one sentence, one sentence, at least what we have recorded. And even Joel and Amos and Hosea, who have compelling stories connected to their books, Micah's book is basically a record of his messages to the people of Israel and Judah. It's just messages. In fact, he starts out with a, a short section and then the rest of it's more or less poetry. Micah. What does Micah mean? Well, Micah is a shortened version of Micaiah, which means who is like Yahweh. He prophesied somewhere between 739 and 686 BC. That was uh, in context, you, you need to remember that, that the northern kingdom of, of Israel uh, was conquered by the Assyrians in 722, 723 BC. Um, he, was, he was prophesying in the southern kingdom of of Israel, I mean southern kingdom of Judah, contemporary with Isaiah, um, under the kings of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Micah had messages from, for both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. He was a country person from Morasheth Gath, very close to the vicinity of the Philistine city of Gath. Now, do any of you re recall anything significant about Gath? That maybe it was discussed in the Bible. Goliath came from there. Goliath came from Gath, exactly. And he had some problems with some young ladies who lived down in that area. Ken, you, you mentioned uh, that Micah's name meant... Uh, who, who is, is it? like Yahweh. Now, is that a question or is that yes. a statement? It, and it could be taken either way. But it's usually thought of as a question. Yeah. Mike is actually referred to as a historical character in Jeremiah 26. Maybe we should, um, we should look at that first. Jeremiah 26, 18 and 19. Now, Jeremiah would have lived 
a while later, a hundred plus years after, well, about a hundred years after Micah. And he said, when Hezekiah was king of Judah, the prophet Micah of Moresheth told all the people that the Lord Almighty had said, Zion will be plowed like a field, Jerusalem will become a pile of ruins, and the temple hill will become a forest. King Hezekiah and the people of Judah did not put Micah to death. Instead, Hezekiah honored the Lord and tried to win his favor. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he said he would bring on them. Now we are about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves. Now, why do you suppose um, Jeremiah would be quoting Micah in that spot? If we change, maybe he'll change his mind about us. Not only that, they were about to do Jeremiah in for his prophecies, and he's saying to these people, look, Micah prophesied this a hundred years ago, and nobody did him in. <laughs> I mean, you know, think, right? So, anyway, so clearly Jeremiah thought Micah was a historical character that was worth quoting. Micah is very much like Isaiah. Some people call Micah the shorthand version of Isaiah. And a little bit more history. The dominant force, foreign power during the period of Micah was Assyria, without a question. Now, where is Assyria located? I probably should have called up my map here real quick, but uh, maybe we can do that. North of Babylon, northern Okay, Babylon northern still today. wasn't... Uh, Babylon well, still wasn't a major... what became Babylon. Yeah, what became Babylon. Ma ba Babylon still wasn't a major event in those days. Um, Northeast of what is now Israel, right? Yes. Or what was Israel back then, too? Uh, we'll have a map, I think, here, if I could get my... And when they came into uh, Judah and Israel, they had to come down from the north, and they, they didn't go across the... That's right. ...from the east. So we'll have here in just a second. It's not going to show me what I want to see. Um, but anyway, Assyria is basically um, what part of would be today part of northern Iraq and the country of Syria. Most of it was was dominated by Assyria. It, don't don't mix up Assyria and Syria. Those are two different countries. Both Judah and Israel, as well as their neighbors, were heavily influenced by what Assyria did. Most nations at that time had conscripted uh, citizen armies. So if, if an enemy attacks, you call out all the farmers and they go out there to fight. Uh, but Assyria had a large, full-time, professional army, which none could match. As conquests were made, mercenaries were hired on as soldiers as well supported by heavy tributes exacted from subjugated territories, this professional army was free to enforce Assyrian rule and make new conquests. And the Assyrians worshipped the god of war. So you can see how all that would fit together. What are mercenaries? Mercenary is a, is a soldier that's paid to fight. Maybe he doesn't even belong to this nation, but he's willing to come in for a certain price, usually a fairly good price, he's willing to fight. Yeah. Well, three significant events took place during the era of Micah that were related to Assyria. And this is, this is really what we need to know and understand our story. In 734-732, probably just about in the middle of Micah's uh, activities there, Tiglath-Pileser III led a campaign from Assyria against parties of parts of Israel and Judah, as well as Syria. Notice the difference between Assyria and Syria here, and the land of the Philistines. Assyria won a resounding victory. All the nations had to pay heavy tribute, but the northern kingdom of Israel suffered the most and lost most of its territory. So by 734, Israel, the northern kingdom, had already lost most of its territory to Assyria. Then about 10, a little over 10 years later, 722, 721, maybe 723, Shalmaneser IV of Assyria besieged the northern kingdom's capital of Samaria, and after... Uh, maybe two or three years of siege conquered uh, Samaria and just scattered its people. So um, that's the end of, of those ten tribes of Israel as far as we know. I mean, there were some people that escaped from there down into the southern kingdom, but as, basically as far as tribes were concerned, they disappeared into history. When the Assyrians conquered 
did the people themselves run or did Assyria actually take the people, put some here, some there? And the answer is some of both. Some of both. Yeah. So they were well dispersed. Yes. So another 20 years later, around the year 701 BC, during the reign of Hezekiah, Judah unwisely joined a revolt against Assyria. Remember, Assyria had already overrun part of Judah's territory. King Sennacherib overran much of the country, but Jerusalem was spared in the end. And why was Jerusalem spared? Because of the slaying of the 185,000 Assyrians. Look at uh, Isaiah 36, I'm sorry, 37, verse 36. An angel of the Lord went to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 soldiers. At dawn the next day, there they lay, all dead. Then the Assyrian emperor Sennacherib withdrew and returned to Nineveh, and if you read on, he was murdered by his sons. Did someone pray for protection? That's why they the angel did. of the Lord came? That's exactly right. What happened was this, a very significant. If you find in the Bible, you look at times when God steps in and does things dramatic, it's usually because his enemies, whoever they, in this case the Assyrians, made a direct attack against God himself. They, uh, uh, they came up to the walls, these people came up to the walls of Jerusalem and said, you know, why don't you just surrender and come out? You know there's no way you can stand up against us. We've conquered all these other nations. Don't think that your puny God can save you because none of these other gods saved their nations. And then God acted. Okay. And, that was the, and that's the story of, of Isaiah 36. There's a, quite an interval in between there when they were under siege, though, wasn't it? Well, they were under siege for a while, yeah. And it looked like maybe they were going to fall, and then God stepped in, and that was the end of it. Well, Micah's book, of course, must be read in light of these events. The prophet was obviously a keen observer of current events, but God's message to him speaks to his contemporary situation. And just a note in passing, <coughs> if you... If you're reading some kind of correspondence or, or a message from one person to a group of people, the more you understand about the situation in which that would happen, the more likely you are to understand what, what they were saying and why they were saying it. Was Micah a priest? Have anything? Micah was a farmer. He was a farmer. Yes, a country person. Yeah. And who wrote the book of Micah? Well, as far as we know, it was Micah. Yeah, we, we don't have any evidence that anybody else wrote it. Well, within Israel and Judah, during this time, a shocking contrast between the extremely rich and the oppressed poor developed due to the exploitation of Israel's middle class. By greedy landholders, those would be the extreme rich, the oppressors were supported by Israel's corrupt political and religious leaders. And all this is supported by reading Micah 2 and 3. Because of this failed leadership, the whole nation became morally corrupt and ripe for judgment. So what we have here, we have a bunch of rich people who have the political and civil leaders wrapped around their little finger, and nobody at the lower levels can get justice in any way. So that's what's going on, okay? Hmm. Sounds dangerously current. <laughs> now, why would you say that? <laughs> Jay, were you going to comment? Uh, it just seems seems strange that a whole country can get so wrapped up in in something so corrupt that way. Reading Micah, it was if you wanted to get if you wanted to get anything, it was under the table with a little money. Yeah. And if you had the money or or whatever it was, that's the way you got justice. And yeah. that's um, many countries in the world today that deal that same way. Yeah. Some continents. Well, but my next question is, then how come there's not some big Babylon or some big Assyria coming down there to beat up on those countries and take them captive? Why is it that it's just happened here to, to Israel? And Maybe I got another it, question to follow okay. that, but, but... Okay, well, let, me, let me take a shot at that. <clears throat> Maybe it's because at that point in time there was a nation identified, rightly or wrongly, identified as God's people, and somebody was after them. Guess who? Well, the devil, perhaps. Sure. You know, as I was... He was doing everything he possibly could to make God look bad. So, 
Okay. One, one of the themes I've, I find here in Micah, and actually a lot of the Old Testament prophets, especially the minor prophets, it's, when you read them, it seems to be the same song over and over and over again. You're, you have become corrupt, and God is going to withdraw from you, and there's going to be some big power that's going to come in and, and take you over. Um, and as I le read some of the details, that, you know, I look at my own country, mm -hmm. and I see things that, um, and you know, everybody has their own views, and their own. it seems to me like today things are, are, from a Christian's point of view, at least this Christian's point of view, things don't look, you know, real good. And um, yet at the same time, I, I look around and I do see s some good things. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not like the whole country. Is there, there are signs of goodness in our <coughs> country. Um, just uh, today I was listening on the news. They were talking that we got a bunch of, of, of <coughs> maybe sea lions washing up on the shores. They're sick or malnourished or something. And there's people, there's organizations out there that are, are, are they're American people that are going out there to help these creatures. We have, I'm dismayed at the numbers of of homeless kids that are reported in my own community, but you know we do have we do have or orphanages, we do have foster care system. It's not like so. Are we really all that? Are we, are we are we this bad yet? Or 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 well, I mean, were there people <laughs> taking care of other people here too? Or wh where a, is it when some, we a few, but not many. And 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 another thing is is. Um, you know, I don't hear any preachers. I'm not. I hope I'm not taking over the whole thing here. But we don't hear any preachers today speaking out like this. Yes, there are no micas. It's not or politically correct. It's all. It all seems kind of self improvement stuff and things like that. And I mean, but some of these t TV evangelists have thousands of people in front of them when we don't hear anything like this. Maybe should we be, or, or are we this? I don't know. It's. I, it's a question I have, and yeah, I just... Fair enough. Well, following the introductory statement, let, let's work our way through Micah, and let's see what we can learn. Following the introductory statement in the first verse of the first chapter, the entire rest of the book of Micah is written in poetic form. This is, of course, Hebrew poetry, not rhyme and rhythm, the kind of poetry we know. During Micah's ministry, the northern kingdom of Israel was overthrown, and the people were scattered by Assyria. Michael said that the people of Judah were really no better than the people of Israel. Judah's captivity in Babylon did not come until 120 years later. Notice the following words about the corruption going on in Micah's day. Now this is, you know, if we had time we would look through all of this, but we're just, I'm trying to summarize so that we can focus on what we think are the really important points. Among the ordinary lay people, now we're, this is not the political leaders, not the religious leaders now, they continually plot evil. These are Micah's words. They continually plot evil. They practice fraud and violence. They reject the Holy Spirit. They're insolent thieves. They mistreat widows and orphans. That's his words about the ordinary people. Well, of course, the, the rich, that would be. Among the leaders now, the ones who are supposed to be spiritual and political and civil leaders, they are drunken liars. They hate good and love evil. They devour the sheep. Of course, that's a term for the poor people. They despise justice, they shed innocent blood, and they accept bribes. Does that sound like a great place to be living? Well, <clears throat> it might seem normal if things slowly got that way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, people may not know they're so bad until a prophet comes and points it out to them. Yeah. This is an extremely bad situation when you consider they have <clears throat> the Ten Commandments available to yeah. them, or, or do they? You know, there was a time when these things disappeared, they were lost. Yeah. Are they available at this time in their history? Well, hold on just a minute. Do you think, and I guess it's fair for me just to ask this as a question, do you think the time ever came in Israel when everybody had forgotten what was in the Ten Commandments? No. I don't think so. There were all, there must have always been. Remember, Elijah said, I'm the only one left, and God says, no, there are 7,000 left here. So we could assume Micah might be one of these people. I, I we assume, yeah. You know, I mean, when if you were God looking down 
and you wanted to communicate a message to someone, who would you pick? The most wicked guy you can find? I don't think so. You know, when like a population is like a, a bowl of water. Mm -hmm. Only God can tell how polluted that water is, how, how far the garbage, I mean, the society may look good on the surface, only God knows how much pornography, lying, cheating, and everything is going on. And so sometimes we think, oh, everything looks okay. And God says no. I, I think there's a sense in which we be kind of become a, accommodated mm -hmm. to the evil around us. Absolutely. And uh, God may, may be thinking what, how terrible this is, and we're sitting here kind of saying, well, kind of as usual, isn't it? We're pretty this good. Is the, this is the old story of putting the frog in the, hot wa in the cool water right. and gradually heating it up until you boil him. That's well, right. didn't Ellen White say that when the end comes, some people will say, hey, things are not that bad. Why, why is it ending now? Well, well the Bible says that. That's the message to the Laodiceans. You yeah. think you're so red hot? <laughs> it, ain't, it really well, isn't that way. how bad it was. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, let's, let's look at Micah's words. Look at Micah 3. Read, we'll read f verses 5 to 11 just to get a feel for how bad things were. My people are deceived by prophets who promise peace to those who pay them, but threaten war for those who don't. To those prophets, the Lord says, Prophets, your day is almost over. The sun is going down on you. Because you mislead my people, you will have no more prophetic visions, and you will not be able to predict anything. Those who predict the future will be disgraced by their failure. They will all be humiliated because God does not answer them. But as for me, the Lord fills me with his spirit and power and gives me a sense of justice and the courage to tell the people of Israel what their sins are. Listen to me, you rulers of Israel. Now he turns to the rulers. You that hate justice and turn right into wrong. Great kind of leaders, huh? You're building God's city, Jerusalem, on a foundation of murder and injustice. The city's rulers govern for bribes. The priests interpret the law for pay. The prophets give their revelations for money. And they all claim that the Lord is with them. No harm will come to us, they say. The Lord is with us. And in Jeremiah's day, do you remember what they kept saying? <clears throat> no, Jerusalem will be protected because what's here in the middle of our city? The temple. The temple. No, God will never allow anyone to destroy Solomon's temple. They were saying all those things. Didn't they believe those things? Presumably, at least some of them must and have how, believed it. How wrong they were. Yeah. It's a lesson that we have to be very wary of. Well, you aren't suggesting that we could be wrong, are you? I am. <coughs> well, that's that side of the table. That's that <laughs> side of the table. We know what we're doing over there. Right. <laughs> well, what do you think about this? Just We're talking about these people that Micah's preaching against. Mm -hmm. Look at Micah 2.11. These people want the kind of prophet who goes about full of lies and deceit and says, I prophesy that wine and liquor will flow for you. Or follow God and you will be prosperous. Um, Philip's translation puts it this way. The sort of prophet this people wants is a windbag and a liar prophesying a future of wines and spirits. A windbag and a liar. Have the duties of the prophets been taken over by the politicians today? Because we, they make a lot of promises. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm sure there's lots of, lots of politicians who'd like to be prophets. Yeah. I don't think they qualify. No. So do many of the preachers of today uh, yeah. preach the health and wealth gospel. That's right. How would you like to attend a, a, a church where the pastor was uh, behaving like that? Can uh, the TNIV uh, states that verse rather interestingly. Okay. If liars and deceivers come and say, we will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, they would be just the prophets for this people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, does, is that significantly different than Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Look at 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. The time will come when people will not listen to sound doctrine, but will follow their own desires and will collect for themselves more and more teachers who will tell them what they are itching to hear. 
They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to legends. Is that, how does that sound? <laughs> we all want to hear what we want to hear. Sounds contemporary. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, yeah. more of the health and wealth ministry. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, some of the prophets who, who contradicted that kind of a message got stuffed in a log and sawed in too. That's so right. doesn't it just make, I mean, it's very practical. You just, what, what use is it if you preach the truth and get sawed in too? And people leave after they've sawed you in two and just go on their merry way. Okay, let, let, let's look at some of the challenges in the book of Micah. Some in that of the case, the one, you saw, the one that was doing the sawing got converted. Yeah, amazing, huh? Uh, look at some of the very interesting things in the book of Micah. Look at Micah 4, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And there people will say, Let us go up the hill of the Lord to the temple of Israel's God. He will teach us what he wants us to do. We will walk in the paths he has chosen, for the Lord's teaching comes from Jerusalem. From Zion he speaks to his people. He will settle disputes among the nations, among the great powers near and far. They will hammer their swords into plows and their spears into printing knives. Nations will never again go to war, never prepare for battle again. Okay, and compare that with Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And days to come, the mountain where the temple stands will be the highest one of all, towering above all the hills. Many nations will come streaming to it, and their people will say, Let us go up the hill of the Lord to the temple of Israel's God. He will teach us what he wants us to do. We will walk in the paths he has chosen, for the Lord's teaching comes from Jerusalem, from Zion. He speaks to his people. You know, that sounds like people that have a new heart because they want to come to the Lord and do what the Lord wants them to do. Mm -hmm. That's their delight. Mm -hmm. Where these people during Micah's days wanted to do what their own heart wanted to do and not what God had laid down for them. So those two verses you read shows a people with a changed heart. Mm -hmm. And God says, I will give you a, um, uh, take away your heart of stone. So are those people converted? I mean, did those people exist in Micah's day or is that talking about the future? I mean, it's hard to know. The, the, the question that scholars have raised is, it looks like either Micah borrowed from Isaiah or Isaiah borrowed from Micah. Is that a problem? Which one lived first? They were contemporary. Oh. I looked at these earlier word for word from Micah 4, 1 through 4 and Isaiah 2, 2 plus, word for word except one, insignificant word yeah. in my translation anyway. Yeah. Okay, let's say one borrowed from the other and I don't know which. So what? I agree. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, no, some, people, some people get all bent out of shape about that kind of stuff. And we're going to, we, we look, what are the issues here? Did it come from God or not? Okay, that's the most important issue. It's also possible that this was a common expression of saying that people were saying those days and both of them were quoting some kind of common expression. That's also possible. Or God showed them both the same thing. Or God showed them both the same thing. And there's I have, the truth. I have yeah. not heard a movement to throw these books out of the Bible because maybe they copied from each other. Well. If you look at the Bible, you'll discover that there's a lots of duplication. 90% uh, of Mark is either in Matthew or Luke. 90% of it. Uh, Isaiah 37 is verbatim 2 Kings 19. 2 Samuel 22 is identical to Psalm 18. Do those things worry you? Not in the least. Well, there are some people who say that we should throw out Ellen White because they say she borrowed. Now, you may be aware that um, a very professional, a very expensive law firm took a look at that uh, question. They spent a year studying it and said, no, there were no there's no evidence of real uh, borrowing in the writings of Ellen White. So whether that satisfies you or not, we need to say that Ellen White isn't the only one who apparently did that sort of thing. And uh, there are some people, if you say that to them, they become very angry. One 
person that I know of said, don't you dare try to destroy my Bible to protect Ellen White. Well, you know, if, like when I read on the internet, I read in the newspaper, I read in the Bible, I wish that I was wise enough to know what to discard and what to borrow. I mean, that takes wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Were Micah and Isaiah in the same locale? Yes. Well, I mean, Isaiah was a relative of the king, probably lived in Jerusalem. Micah was a country person that lived, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 miles from Jerusalem. They have gotten together and had a, a prophecy they may have conference. conference. <coughs> may have borrowed from a third person. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's kind of poetry. It may well have been some song or yeah. poem that was very common easily. in the country. Could have been, yes. You know, um, it's very good. Yeah. I like that. Well, in ancient times, now we're going we're, we're, we're to look at, take, take into a serious look at what the issues are here. In ancient times, it was believed that when two nations were at war and one nation conquered the other, it was because the conquering nation's God was more powerful than the God of the defeated nation. That's what people believed right throughout the, the ancient Near East. So why would God allow his people to be captured and scattered throughout Assyria and later allow his people from Jerusalem and Judah to be taken into Babylonian captivity? Wouldn't that send a wrong message? And why did God allow his people to be in, in, in Egyptian captivity for all that time? I mean, how, why, if you believe that idea, why would you even take a second look at Israel or, 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 or Judah saying maybe their God is worth looking at? You would that only, God? What has he done for his people? You would only take a look at him after the God went in and rescued him. But it shows maybe God's desperation. He had to let his people go because um, they were so rebellious. But when God did reach in and capture him, uh, did his reputation then improve? Well, here, and that's the question. <clears throat> how does God, in that kind of an environment where people believe like that, how does God go about disciplining his own people? Uh, yeah, and how does captivity going to solve those problems? Yeah. I mean, you could say, well, he was disciplining the northern tribal tribes of Israel. Disciplining? They disappeared. Many of them were killed and the rest were scattered. And we don't hear from them ever again. Doesn't God, doesn't God say in the Bible that if you don't do my ways, that these things will happen? Sure. And I mean, sure. why should God keep together a group of people that are not following him? Because people are known, I mean, the world looks on and says, these are, these are Yahweh's followers. Look what's happening to them. Is he disciplining them, or is he, is he saving them? Is by, eventually they're going to go into the hands of the Babylonians. Probably somehow, yes and yes. Is he somehow, <laughs> I mean, you normally we don't read these passages with any kind of a concept that he's trying to save these people, protect them we're, in we're, a way. We're trying to get people to take a serious look at what it says here. Dennis? Isaiah 48, mm -hmm. verses 9 to 11. In order that people will praise my name, I am holding my anger in check. I am keeping it back and will not destroy you. I have tested you in the fire of suffering, as silver is refined in a furnace. But I have found that you are worthless. What I do is done for my own sake. Exactly. I will not let my name be dishonored or let anyone else share the glory that should be mine and mine alone. I can hear some people saying, my good, goodness, you have a God that is absolutely, totally narcissistic. How do we defend that? Well, there, there's, there, that's a very good question and there's a good answer. Is there is there anything that bad that God has ever done for anybody that didn't have, maybe it might seem bad temporarily, that doesn't have in the larger context a good outcome? Can you think of anything? All things work for good. Well, that's not what the scripture says. It actually says, in all things God works for good. That's Romans 8, 28. And that's exactly what he does. In all things God works for good to those who love him. 
But we may not see it till after we're dead. That's the problem. The eldest in Egypt didn't think that they were treated well. Well, but okay, that happened in one night. In I'm Egypt. asking you. I'm asking you. Okay, in the in the longer picture, the bigger picture. That's why it's important for us to know the bigger <coughs> picture, so we can maintain our faith during those times. Yeah. Uh, the flood is a good example. This okay. was an absolute catastrophic event, yes. but the purpose was to save. Um, well, save so so that so that life could go on. Yeah. Basically, what happened there is God said, "Evil's becoming so rampant that despite 120 years of preaching, I'm I'm going to manage to save one family, and that one family." wasn't all that good. But he said, the la this is the last connection I have to planet Earth. I have to do something to, to, to rescue them from this rampant evil. So the, 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 the flood was a rescue operation. You know, when you get baptized, most preachers don't tell you that God is going to work on you to clean you up. And he may mm -hmm. put you in a fire to purge you. Yeah. I mean, that is not told. And then after you're baptized and things happen, you go, what is happening to me? Everything's supposed to be roses and whatever now that I'm baptized. And God is changing you as a person through some of these events. A famous Adventist preacher by the name of Morris Venden, who passed away not long ago, preached a very well-known sermon entitled, Doing Worse When We Pray. <laughs> and that's exactly what he was talking about. Well, look at another passage, Micah 4, starting with verse 13. I'm going to read 13, the last verse of Micah 4 and the first verse of Micah 5. The Lord says, People of Jerusalem, go and punish your enemies. I will make you as strong as a bull with iron horns and bronze hoofs. You will crush many nations, and the wealth they got by violence you will present to me, the Lord of the whole world. Do you suppose that was a key text in Jesus' day? You bet. <laughs> what do you mean a key text? That well, one they love to quote. Oh, because they thought Jesus was going to come as a conqueror. Well, then, then I'm talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. This is what this is the Messiah they were looking for. Okay. Now you're you're heading into. I'm going to save my question for when you get down there to Bethlehem. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to verse five, uh, chapter five, verse one. People of Jerusalem, gather your forces. We are besieged. They are attacking the leaders of Israel. Now that seems like a complete shift. I mean, verse 13, they're conquering the world and the world's wealth is going to flow into Jerusalem. And, whoa, man, a life, chapter 5, and suddenly Jerusalem is being besieged and it looks like it's going to be overrun. How did that happen? Do you think, they may, you think that was a key text? No. Probably not. <clears throat> well, let's move on to the next verse, and this is the famous one. The Lord says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are a, one of the smallest towns in Judea, but out of you I will bring a ruler for Israel, whose family line goes back to ancient times. And this is a case where I want to, you know, I like my Good News Bible, but I'm going to quote from uh, the King James, because um, I want to get a little bit more literal translation. So we'll, we'll bear with the language, it's a little harder to understand. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, I, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings for, forth have been from of old, from everlasting. I want you to notice first of two or three things in this verse. Three things. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, be, shall he come forth. I'm going to stop right there for a second. How do we always interpret that verse? Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. And that's, and that's, what, the, that's what the scribes and Pharisees told Herod. That's what the wise men heard. And they went where? They went to Bethlehem and there was Jesus, right? But notice what it says next. We sometimes don't connect this. The one who's going to come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel? Did Jesus end up being ruler in Israel? No. Not yet. Oh. Not yet. 
So what are we talking about here? So there's a prophecy of his first coming, but immediately it goes on to what we now believe is a prophecy of his second coming. You can see how the people in Jesus' day might have been a little confused, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to come back as King of King and Lord of Lords. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't Jesus, when he, Jesus himself gave a prophecy, he, he mixed times up? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Yeah. But now notice what else says. This person who's going to be born in Bethlehem, who's going to end up being the king. So here's a future event, a time in, in history. He's going to eventually become a king forever. But not only that, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So what are we saying about this child who was born in Bethlehem? Was this his, was this his origin? Nope. He no. existed from eternity past, born in Bethlehem, and he's going to rule in the future. Eternity in the future, exactly. And he came here and he hung on a cross, so it can't yeah. mean, yeah. This seems out of context in a way. Mm -hmm. It sounds like Micah is saying, look, there's your, your condition as a nation is in terrible condition. Mm -hmm. And God is going to send a country, another nation down here, to, to take you captive. And uh, um, it seems like we're dealing with the here and the now. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, um, we're interpreting mm -hmm. that here the, the message continues, but now all of a sudden the remedy for this mm -hmm. is, isn't here and now. It, we're talking about something way off in the future. Yeah, it, it's it, it could be argued that it seems to me that way back down here in our time, we're looking back and we're pulling something out of here, okay. extrapolating a text that really doesn't have anything to do with this. But we're putting it. Uh, uh, we're we're saying this it's, is it's, is a messianic prophecy, and the argument could be made, well, Jesus did it, so, but then the argument could also be made that, well, maybe Jesus pulled it out improperly as well. How do you, you know, the Old okay. Testament seems to have a lot of that in it. You read along and okay. all of a sudden we jerk something out, it's a messianic prophecy. How do you, how do you? Okay, do you, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you, can you think of any other occurrences in the Old Testament, very specifically to this kind of setting that pre pre predicted almost exactly the same thing? Well, what I'm saying is that there are there are many Old Testament prophets who who do that. You're reading along about a about a problem that's here and now, and then all of a sudden there's something we pull out there that we apply to the Messiah. The most famous one is Isaiah seven to nine. There's a virgin going to give birth. Well, the virgin comes the virgin comes in the New Testament. The Old Testament thing doesn't say virgin. It says a young woman of marriageable age is going to give birth, and he's going to be called God is with us, Emmanuel. And it was actually a story of Isaiah's birth. I mean, not Isaiah's son, the birth of Isaiah's son. And there it is. But all of a sudden you get over to Isaiah 9, and who is this baby now? Isaiah 9, verse 6. Jesus. Mighty Counselor, Wonderful Mighty. God. Everlasting Father, Comforter. Prince of Peace. Comforter, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who's that? That's Jesus. Well, here's exactly the same thing happening. And remember we said Micah's a shorthand version of Isaiah? Three chapters in Isaiah, one verse in Micah. And the same message exactly. So how are these people supposed to figure that out? Here, it's, it's, in, it's in our sentence here in, the, mm -hmm. in these notes you have. At a time when disaster was mm -hmm. being prophesied for Judea, similar to what had recently taken place in Israel, it was important for God to point out he had plans for those people and that in place for hundreds of years mm -hmm. to come. Yeah, it took, yeah. I see there's a and typographical error. Some kind of typographical <laughs> error. We'll have to fix that. At times it seemed that the Davidic line of kings had disappeared and all the promises had been, been given to David would fail. But then the Messiah was born, just as Micah had predicted in the region of Ephrathah and the town of Bethlehem, and all that changed. The eternal king was a descendant of King David and will represent his line forever. So the prophecy served as a reminder for those who cared enough to read it and believe in Yahweh and that he still had plans for the children of his friends, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or, or Israel. 
You know, so at times of disaster, it's nice to have something to hold on to. You know, like sometimes you look in the, cl in the sky and it has all these dark clouds and it has a little bit uh, like a ray. My mom used to say the angels are looking down from heaven. But I think that's there to remind you the sun is there. Yeah. And just like that, the prophecies, these people can't see anything, but God wants to remind them that he's still there. Yeah. As is the case in many Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, Micah 5, 2 makes a reference to the first and the second comings of Jesus. With his first coming, the prophet says that he would be born in the city of Bethlehem. At his second coming, he will become ruler over the people of Israel. We know that the Jews rejected the Messiah at his first coming and did not allow him to rule over them. However, Israel will recognize the Messiah at his second, the true Israel, will recognize the Messiah at his second coming and will allow him to become their ruler for eternity. The last part of this verse re refers to Jesus' divine nature, his pre-incarnate existence by saying, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Thus, within this one short verse, we have a revelation of the Messiah's identity in eternity past and his incarnation and eternity future. I think that's pretty remarkable. You know, that is one evidence why this book is, is inspired. Yeah. How can one person think of a sentence like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I like to put a little, um, an interesting little anecdote in here that's a little bit off from the study, um, from our lesson, but I think it illustrates the point we've just made. An elderly black pastor in the southern United States described the visit of Jesus to Jerusalem at the age of 12. And you all remember that Jesus was taken down there for his bar mitzvah, and he got into the temple, and he started asking questions and so forth, and his parents took off and left him there. Anyway, that time, as Jesus was sitting among the scholarly rabbis and asking them questions the likes of which they had never heard before, coming from this kid, one of them turned to him and said, Son, how old are you? And according to this elderly black pastor, he, Jesus hesitated for a moment and then answered, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12. But on my father's side, I'm older than time. Surely this would qualify him as being one whose goings forth have been from of old, from <laughs> everlasting. I always have to chuckle. I love that story. Well, the next major passage we need to look at is found in Micah 6. Look at Micah 6, 1 to 8. And this is the Lord's case against Israel. And many people believe that this is the most succinct, straightforward, lay it on the line presentation of the message of the Old Testament. Listen to the Lord's case against Israel. Arise, O Lord, and present your case. And remember, notice that the, the, the Lord in caps here, we're talking about the personal name Yahweh, the personal name for God. Arise, O Yahweh, and present your case. Let the mountains and the hills hear what you say. You mountains, you everlasting foundations of the earth, listen to the Lord's case. Yahweh has a case against his people. He is going to bring an accusation against Israel. Yahweh says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I been a burden to you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt. I rescued you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead you. My people, remember what King Balak of Moab planned to do to you, and how Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. Remember the things that happened on the way from the camp at Acacia to Gilgal. Remember these things, and you will realize what I did in order to save you. So, what shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn as offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? I mean, what could you give more than that? I mean, imagine sacrificing your child. No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, and that word means righteous, to show constant love and to live, hum to live in humble fellowship with our God. That's it? That's, That's it. all we got to do? That's all we got to do. <laughs> it summarizes all prophetic teachings on true religion. A life displaying justice, mercy, and a close walk with God. Is it, is it easy to do that? I didn't say it was easy, did I? 
<laughs> but we need to understand what's going on here. Justice is something that people do when prompted by God's Spirit. You have to be motivated by God. So the answer to your question is you can't do it. Mm -hmm. You have no ability. You have no desire. It has to be given to you. And then when you claim that power, you can do anything. He does it in you. Is that in the passage there someplace? That, is that part of the instruction? That's part of what you get to know after you try it for a while. <laughs> so you're supposed to be just without the court's prompting or without a policeman's uh, prompting. Hold on. We're, we're going to talk about this. So hold your oh, question Oh, okay, a okay. I, I just wanted to get this yeah. down solid. Okay, we're going to do that in just if a If there's moment. only three things that yeah. we have to do to please God, let's get them. It has to do with fairness and equality for all, especially the weak and powerless who are exploited by others. Kindness means to freely and willingly show love, loyalty, and faithfulness to others. Walking with God means to put God first and to live in conformity with His will. So why is it easier? Here's your question. Why is it easier to keep the Sabbath and other ceremonial requirements? We, we like those ceremonial requirements. Keep them strictly than it is to do justly, love, mercy, and walk humbly before God. Well, doing those things, that is, the ceremonial requirements, require, I'm sorry, doing the, the right things requires an abandonment of selfishness and an acceptance of love as one's modus operandi. That's the problem. You've got to give up yourself and go for God. Micah 6, 8, the, well, the, know, the punchline, gives us this answer. Yes. Okay, go ahead. It's the verse par excellence for biblical ethics and describes a true Christian lifestyle. In order to better understand what God is saying to Micah, we need to become acquainted with one crucial feature of biblical Hebrew thinking. When biblical authors want to explain a sequence of different actions, they describe them usually from the effect to the cause. This principle works from the visible to the invisible, from the superficial to the real, from the outside to the inside. We think and speak differently today. We explain things from cause to effect. Now let's see if we can apply that. In other words, to understand what Micah is really saying, to catch his message, we need to reverse his sequence of thoughts, to put it the way we would usually say it. We need to begin to study this verse starting from the end. Thus the proper sequence for us today is, first, Walk humbly with Yahweh. This is the cause of all other actions described. Second, love mercy. This is the first result. Finally, act justly. That means do what's right, act righteously. This is the ultimate consequence for those who walk with God. So, walk humbly with God will result in loving mercy because you become like Jesus who loved mercy. And then finally, you will do always what is right. You will act justly. And that's the ultimate consequence. Walk humbly with your God. It's the first four Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is the next six. Mm -hmm. Do you know that those directions have absolutely no guidance like ritual or anything? I mean, they take your reasoning and brain to do them like when you're encountering everyday things and he, and he doesn't say uh, wash your hands in a basin of blue and dry it with a red cloth or anything like that. He just says, be kind. You have to think how, what is kindness and, and apply it in every situation. And rituals maybe are easier because you can do them with a numb mind mm -hmm. and you don't have to think. And you don't have to give up your selfishness. Right. Well, and also with rituals, don't you get more brownie points than you do? Like when you do well, kindness and justice, sometimes uh, that goes unnoticed. And, and the people, the people who want to count, credit, count up the credits, yeah, they want things that you can check off. Yeah. You know, it's easier to follow 400 rules about how to keep the Sabbath than to really keep the Sabbath. Than to be kind. Well, it's very easy using ceremonial things and Sabbath keeping and so forth, as important as that is, if it's misunderstand, uh, misunderstood, 
to turn a blessing into a curse, even in our day. It is almost guaranteed that if you do not fully understand why you're doing something, you're just mechanically doing it, before long it will be turned into something very different from what was intended. Virtually every religious practice has been perverted in one way or another. But if our religion is understood as a joyous opportunity to get to know our Father and God better, it is much more likely, much less likely, I'm sorry, that we will lose its meaning. Why was this apparently so hard to understand? Do you see any evidence that the people in Micah's day and Isaiah's day were delighted about their growing relationship with Yahweh? Think of all that Jesus and Paul said about how the Jewish system had been corrupted in their day. How can we prevent that from happening in our day? Has it already begun to happen? Do you know anybody who practices their religious things ceremonially just because they think it's the right thing to do? I have one more quick question in the last few seconds really that we have left. Micah 7, 8, Mike, I'm sorry, Micah 7, 18 to 20 says that God will take our sins and throw them in the bottom of the sea. Has anybody been down there to have a look? Do you think, how do you throw sins in the bottom of the sea? It's a figure of speech. A figure of speech. You don't mean there's, no, there's not really a pile of sins down there? But what does the figure mean? He won't hold them against you. They will be far, far away. To the Jewish people in ancient times who used to think very concretely this is basically another way of saying what happened on the Day of Atonement. The sins were, cere well, well, at least in, in figure, in symbol, they were transferred from the tabernacle onto the head of the scapegoat, and the, the scapegoat was taken way far away somewhere so it could never come back, probably eaten by a lion. And for people who think concretely, they have to see something actually happening. Think, okay, there went our sins. That's but, sort of like children. Yeah. To them, they were gone, never to be seen again. Yeah, that's, that's what we're that's, talking about that's here. That's the model. Do you think sins can actually be put in the bottom of the sea? What would they do down there? Anyway, well, I, heard, I, heard, I heard one, one reference that said, in the new earth, there'll be no sea. So that okay. takes care of it. <laughs> think about it for next week. See you then.